behaviors. These are actions by the nurse that invite trust and inspire confidence um, in others. Kind of other people have confidence in nurses because of the behavior. One of the things that you will see is that when they do polls of the most trustworthy professions, nurses are always number one. The only year that we were not number one was in 2012, and firefighters were number one that year. Okay, But we were number two. But the next year, we bumped back up to number one. So what you will see is that nurses are one of the most trusted professions out there. And part of that is because of these professional behaviors and the philosophy of care uh, that we um, engender in our patients. Now, what we're talking about with professional behaviors are behaviors that are responsible, behaviors that are accountable, they're self-directed, and that appear professional, okay? So some of those components are these. So, let's look at socialization. Basically, socialization is learning to become a member of a group or society. You learn the social rules, the binding relationships into, into which they're going to enter. In other words, as you become a nurse, you get some of this in nursing school. Okay? Some of this socialization will also occur in your preceptorship. And most of it will be done during your orientation to your job or any subsequent orientation to a new job that you're going to have. Okay? One of the things that used to happen is that you would have nurses that would stay in the same position for 20 years. And that's rare anymore. Okay? So what you're going to see is that a lot of times you will have to be socialized into a new group of people and learn what the norms of that group are as well as what the norms that they hold for their nursing care. And what we hope is that your values and beliefs are very similar. If not, what happens? Conflict, okay? Well, do you stay happy in that position? No. And typically what does happen? You leave. You put in your six months, and then you transfer somewhere else and try to find something that's a better fit. Now, one of the things that you're going to see that also contributes to that professional behavior is that knowledge. It's central in maintaining client safety and meeting expected outcomes. Um, when we talked about continued competence the other day, basically what we were talking about is the continued education that you have to keep up and to keep current in your practice. One of the things that you will find is that your nursing textbooks are basically outdated every five years. Okay? I know you spend a bunch of money on them. But the information that's in that book, the majority of it will be outdated because of why. What do we do constantly? Change because of evidence-based practice. Okay? Basically, it used to be the ward sisters, which were what nurses were called in the uh, UK. <clears throat> they In the morning they got up and fired the furnace with the coal after they'd gotten the coal in. All right? So that the, the room could be a very balmy 50 degrees. And they heated the water for the baths and the breakfast and made the tea and did the little coddled eggs and they did everything. Okay? 
Do we do that anymore? No. The only thing I know how to do on a furnace is the thermostat. And that's all I really care to know about the furnace. Basically, what we're going to see is that, as I said yesterday or whenever, I can't remember, this week has been, um, that continuing education and, and developing that knowledge base is going to be something that you're going to have to continually do. Now, say for example, I decide that I want to work in an ICU. What types of programs are out there if I'm coming directly out of school that might help me in that goal to become an ICU nurse? Journey programs, okay? Do you know what the journey program is? All right. Go ahead and say what journey program at CHS is. Um, it's where you apply for a job in ICU and then they take you through six months of rigorous training, classroom hours, they take you to all the different ICUs in the area, and they like teach you or something, and then they find a hospital that has a patient that has that, and they take you there and let you take care of them. Mm -hmm. So that it is a program that basically what they're doing is they're putting six months of orientation and six months of training into your job orientation. Now, do you think that comes cheaply? No, because they are paying your salary for that entire time you're sitting in the classroom or on orientation. But what is the benefit of that continuing education program or that on-the-job orientation program? Specific training for a critical care unit, okay? What you will see at CMC Maine is that they have... They love their acronyms. They have neurointensive. They have medical intensive. They have surgical intensive. They have trauma intensive. They have PICU uh, and NICU and all the other things that you can think of. They have more ICUs than Rowan has clinics. Okay, they have a bunch of ICUs. Well, what's the benefit of rotating through all of those ICUs? As a new grad, it's cross training. Okay, one of the things that you'll see is that rarely do you see a floor nurse, a med surgeon nurse pulled to the ICU to cover. It usually cross cover between ICU to ICU or floor to floor because the skill set is entirely different. The other benefit, what's the benefit to the person that's in the orientation if they get a taste of all of these ICUs? Which one do they like better? So they hopefully would be able to make a choice because typically with this journey program is that you're hired as an ICU nurse, not a specific unit. And so it's sort of on-the-job training as well as an on-the-job interview because how well you do in that situation will depend on whether they offer you one of their permanent positions or not. Okay. So it's sort of a give-and-take type thing so that people can see what you do, you can see what they do, and see how that fit would be. It's part of the socialization as well. Okay? All right. Competence. Okay, we talked a little bit about this the other day. Um... Awareness of factors, both positive and negative, that affect client care. Uh, the nurse, State Nurse Practice Act defines professional competence and outlines behaviors or actions that indicate incompetence or may result in loss of license. All right, so 
What about with continued competence? How can I lose my license if I don't keep up? They audit me, I don't have documentation, and so what happens? I, they don't renew my license until I can show proof of either that 30 hours of continuing education or 15 hours with 640 practice hours or whatever one of those other options might be. Okay? What are some other things that may cause you to lose your license, competence-wise? Harming a patient in some way, okay? One of the things that you will see is that it's not one med error that's going to cause you to lose your license. But typically what the board looks at for is a pattern of medication errors. One of the things that we talked about in one of the other courses was just cause. Um, basically what that does is it looks at patterns of behavior. Like you make a med error. And I'm going to tell you, any nurse that says they've never made a med error is stupid. They just don't know they have made a med error. Because you will make one, and I'm going to tell you, it will be one of the most devastating things that will happen. I can remember my first one, and I will say first one, because I, it's one of those things that happen, you know, when you've been in practice as long as I have. When I reported it to the doctor, I gave, instead of giving them a morphine pill, I gave them a allotted pill. And I only discovered it when we were doing the narcotics count. Reported it to the doctor, and I was so upset. He said, okay, I have a question for you. Did they get good pain relief? I said, yes. He said, well, let's switch the med. And I'm thinking, oh, God. <laughs> Thank you. So it was sort of fortuitous, but, you know, it was still an error. But what you're going to see is that the Board of Nursing does not really come down hard on you with one, one med error. You're not really reporting to the board unless you make multiple, consistently multiple errors after you have been counseled. Okay? And that may result in loss of license. Of course, the other things, of course, that can cause loss of license are not related to competence, but that might be the use of drugs or alcohol. Remember DWIs or any charges related to drugs and alcohol have to be reported to the board. All right, let's talk a little bit about appearance. This displays the nurse's commitment to professionalism. Okay? One of the things that you will see is that it used to be nurses would wear what? White. All right. When I first started, my school nurse uniform, my nursing school uniform was a dress. And can you imagine hopping up on the bed and pulling someone in a, a dress? Okay. Now, I went to school in the 70s, so where was that hemline? <laughs> Actually, it was sort of like Catholic school. It had to be a dollar bill um, length, uh, no higher than a dollar bill length above your knee. So they would check us every morning. And make sure we had our stockings on. God help us. And then their shoes and the whole nine yards. We didn't have to wear our hats because we were a liberal school. But still we wore the dresses and the hose and the shoes. Okay? When nurses wear white today, 
What does that mean? It usually is not an all-white uniform. It's an accent, right? Okay, northeast, what color do the RNs wear? Gray. What color to, uh, at Rowan, do they wear? The, the navy blue. Okay, so what we have gone to is uniform color to designate role. And one of the things that we do, did that for is to make sure that patients recognized this person as a nurse. Of course, it doesn't help if they don't know that gray means RN. So that's one of the things you need to, to orient them to. Um, so that if someone is in gray or they have a white lab coat on with their gray, that means they're an RN. Over at Northeast, only the RNs can wear white. Um, as a lab coat. Nonverbal communication. All right. Remember that. How much? How? What percentage of our communication is nonverbal? Fairly large. Probably about sixty to seventy percent. Sometimes. So if you come in, what do you want? How? likely is that patient to be able to tell you, well, I need to turn over, or I'm sorry, I pooped the bed. Like if you're, okay, well, let me go get somebody. That's not my job. Not very likely. It's going to basically affect what their first impression is. You know, one of the things that, that Audra said yesterday, or whenever she did the thing on resumes, is they're going to look at that resume for 15 seconds. Well, I hate to tell you guys, but they also look at you for about 15 seconds, and they make up their mind. Typically, what you want to be <clears throat> is the first interview of the day or the last interview of the day because those are the two people that will stick out in their mind. All these people in the middle, they run together. Unless you do something really random and then you'll stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> okay? What types of things do you think that would give a very bad first impression? Chewing gum, that drives me distracted. Not, you know, just quietly chewing gum, but smacking. Drives me crazy. What else? Unkempt hair. Okay, have y'all ever seen the pictures of Guy Fieri before he did his trademark spiky blonde dude? Looks like Jason. <laughs> seriously, seriously, he has dark hair and he had this beard. And now he's got this blonde, spiky hair and this, this goatee. That's his trademark look now. But he looks like a totally different person. What other things would give very bad impressions? Okay, tattoos all over. Let's talk about that. I did some research last night that it was very interesting that when you're talking about baby boomers, okay, you're talking about people, I think one out of 20 people would have a tattoo. But when you're talking about the millennials, okay, you're talking one out of three. And one of the things that you're going to see, and I bet within the next 10 or 15 years, tattoos are going to be very commonplace, and it's not going to be the negative stereotype that we see today. I think it will be the type of tattoo, yeah. Um, you ever been on uh, the website um, about the misspelled tattoos and things like that? Yeah, Tattoo Nightmares is really cool, too. But 
what you're going to see is I think that that will become more mainstream. And I think that as a society, as we progress towards the younger generations, I don't think it's going to be as much of a stereotype. Um, I think that what you're going to see is that, yeah, if you've got half sleeves, you probably still are going to have to cover them up and <coughs> carry them for those 80-year-old ladies until she shows you her butterfly on her. <laughs> but you're, you're going to see that I think it's going to be different. Okay? Clean pressed uniform, clean shoes. Okay? How they walk, speak, gesture, and their tone of voice. All right. I can tell whenever people are coming down the hall what the sort of what the uh, conversation is going to be like because if it's <laughs> okay or <laughs> so it's going to be different you know and you think about those because one of the things I'm going to tell you is that unfortunately what you're going to see is that people do judge you by how you look Okay, you can be the most wonderful nurse in the world, and they will still judge you by how you look. I had a nurse that I worked with over it in Charlotte. This girl was top of her class, was given the award as caregiver of the year. Uh, back before there were three parts on the SAT. She had a 1350 out of 1600. Okay? She also rode motorcycles and had bleached blonde hair with fairly dark roots. And back in the day, they used to do screening interviews. And they screened this girl, didn't give her a second interview. <coughs> wouldn't talk to her. And of course, we were all up in arms. Are you crazy? This is the best student we've got. You know, if you don't take her, someone else will. But she wanted to work in this specific area in the hospital. So, we convinced her that she needed to tone down her hair and to make sure that her roots were not showing. Went for an interview and she now is the nurse manager at the PACU. But just because she did not fit the image of this hospital association, they wouldn't give her a second interview. And it was all about the appearance. All right, nails trimmed, artificial nails. Artificial nails are not one of the things that you want to see on your nurse. Number one, because, you know, they pop off and go flying and hit you in the eye. And number two, their infection control issue. <coughs> Jewelry that can injure the patient. I've seen people with earrings like crazy. You know, I would be wor more worried about the patient reaching up and jerking my earring out than I would be. Um, you know, harming that patient. Perfumes or scented soaps are things that you need to worry about, especially if you're working with post-surgical patients that are very sensitive to smell or oncology patients that are sensitive to smell because nothing will make you sicker than smelling some very sicky, sweet perfume. Um, my daughter calls that bathroom scent that you find in a lot of the, the gas stations, that pink scent, okay, the, it, that sprays out. Basically, I've seen her turn around and come out of the bathroom, we need to go to another gas station because it, it smells pink. <laughs> I said, I'm under, I understand, so we've, we've done that. I can't stand that smell either. But what you're going to see is that a lot of people associate that smell with, well, the last time I smelled that, I vomited. So I don't want to work with that person. All right, let's talk about integrity. 
basically integrity is that adherence to that strict moral code or ethical code. Remember, we talked about the ANA code of ethics for nurses. A um, couple of the ways that nurses demonstrate integrity is accepted feedback, both positive and negative, as a tool for improving delivery of nursing care. Okay? Let me give you a little clue when you're doing interviews. And they will ask you, well, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Don't sit there like a doofus and say, uh, uh, have them already thought up because they will ask. And don't say, well, my weaknesses are. Say, my areas for growth are. Okay, because that is going to be something that you don't want to admit, well, I'm weak in this area. Well, yeah, you are, but I recognize that, and I'm going to grow by doing this. Okay, so think of those things whenever you get ready for interview, because they will ask you. And I'm going to tell you the other thing that you can do, along with doing that resume, is that if you Google interview questions for new nurses, you will get a ton of questions. And one of the things that you'll find is that rarely do you just meet one-on-one -on -one with a nurse manager anymore. It's group interviews. So it'll be four, five, or more people with you sitting at a table and you feel like it's an interrogation because you have to smile and be nice to everyone in the room. And it's sort of like, oh my God, did I make enough eye contact with this person? But get used to those situations. Any of you ever been through group interviews? Okay. What was it like? What kind of questions did they ask? Well, in, in the Army, yeah. A prison guard. What else? Why do you think you deserve this position? Why do you think you deserve this position? You need to come up with an answer. Like I said, it will look better and you seem more prepared if you've looked at some of those questions and at least thought of them. Because coming up with something off the top of your head, a lot of time, that's when you put your foot in your mouth. And you got to be very careful about that. Okay? All right. So, maintaining accountability for their actions. Freely admitting when they make mistakes. It's a hard thing to do. But what you need to do is, yes, I screwed up. This is what I'm going to do to fix it. And let's move on. And hopefully the rest of your group will let you move on. Because a lot of times it just keeps being brought up, brought up, brought back up. Following the Nurse Practice Act, never working outside the scope of practice is one of the ways that we maintain integrity. This is the difference between being a tigger, the ones that think that tiggers, the tiggers are more complete than Eeyore's. Okay. How many of you have worked with a charge nurse? What's your day going to be like? You're going to have a very bad day. It doesn't matter if you have no problems whatsoever with your patient load. A lot of times what you will find is that the attitude of the charge nurse or the person that's in charge of that unit basically determines what the rest of the day is going to be like. If that nurse says, yeah, I know we had two call-ins and we've got two <coughs> nurses, but 
let's work together and we can get it done, you're more likely to have a better day than someone that says, God, two call-ins and two people that don't know what they're doing. This is going to be the crappiest day ever. Well, it probably will be. But attitude really, really makes a difference. Individuals' attitude affects those around them. Complainers. How do you deal with complainers? Walk away. Run. Yeah. Yeah, you tell them to stop complaining. You know, sometimes it gets to the point, yeah, I've heard this story five or six times. What are you going to do about that situation? You know, there's nothing wrong with complaining, but complaining for complaining's sake is not a positive way to take care of a situation. Yeah, what you want to do and what a, an effective charge nurse or effective team leader or an effective nurse manager or boss would do is say, okay, I understand that you, this is the situation. Now, what is your suggestion? <coughs> because not only if you have a complaint, you should think about what are some options that you can do to remedy the situation. And that is the better way, and that's the more professional way of dealing with those situations. Nurses should maintain a positive attitude among clients, among family members, among other healthcare professionals. Is it professional to ever complain to a client or family member about the care that another nurse has gotten mm -hmm. or given? Okay. You may feel that you need to verbalize an apology for the care that they've given. That is appropriate. I'm sorry that you had this experience. Let's start anew and figure out what we need to do from here. And channel them to the appropriate person to complain to. I will send the charge nurse around or the nurse manager around and let you voice your concerns to them. But do you ever say, yeah, that's the third complaint I've got about that nurse today? No. Because what is that doing to the professionalism or the integrity or the competence of that other nurse. It's undermining them. And will that family ever feel comfortable with that nurse taking care of their family again? You know, everybody has a bad day. And it may have just been a set of circumstances. Yeah, I may not have gone into that room for an hour, but that's because we were doing a code on this other patient. Do I tell them we were doing a code? No, can't do that. But sometimes service recovery, which is one of those lovely words that I absolutely abhor, but it's one of those things that you say, I'm sorry we you had this situation. Let's take it from here and we'll see what we're going to do. Now, what about other healthcare professionals? Do you whine and complain about someone else? Who do you go to first if you have a problem with the way that someone is here for you? Yeah, that person. You should go to that person and then say, you know, you left this, this, and this undone, and I do not appreciate having to do enemas on three people for colonoscopy preps. Well, I didn't have time to get it done. Well, 
I could understand that one day, but you've consistently done that to me for the past three days. Perhaps we need to go talk with the nurse manager. Okay? Talk it out with the nurse first. If you don't get anywhere, take it up the chain of command. But that positive attitude is one of the things that you're going to see that will help make it through your day. <coughs> now, compassion. Cut off his head. Don't be compassionate about it. Compassion, remember, is the awareness and concern for other people's suffering. And that can be not only your patients and your patients' families, but it can be your fellow nurses or fellow students as well. <coughs> you demonstrate compassion when they recognize that need and respond appropriately to meet that need. For example, that patient that's frightened to go to surgery. What would want be one of the things that I can do as a nurse to help to try to alleviate those fears? Answer questions. Spend time with them. What else? Sit with them for just a little bit. If they're a praying woman or man, you know, get the chaplain in. Or pray with them yourself. What else could I do, you know, when I accompany that patient to surgery? You could hold their hand. But one of the other things that you could do is at that door where they're met. Now, Miss So-and-so, I want to introduce you to Jackie. She's going to be your nurse in the pre-op area. And hopefully what that will do is relieve her anxiety a little bit because you're backing off, but now she knows someone else's name. Okay, now I'm going to tell you few times with some of the Alzheimer's patients, you give them somebody else's name <laughs> so that they're calling Donna, 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 and there's nobody, no Donna's out there, but that is not a compassionate use. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it, it's one of those things that you feel like doing. Treat the client as a unique and special individual and not as a number of diagnosis. Okay? That's why we say Mr. Smith, not the appendectomy in room 4307. Unique, special individuals. Not only do you want to treat them as an individual, but you want to make sure that you follow through and know a little bit about their culture, know a little bit about their values, know a little bit about their fam family dynamics. Don't know how many times I've had these patients with head injuries that I've had to shuttle his wife and girlfriend number one and girlfriend number two. Mm -hmm. So that girlfriend number one and number two didn't know about wife and wife didn't know about girlfriend number one and two and girlfriend number two didn't know about girlfriend number one. <coughs> so, it gets a little hairy sometimes. Now, if they meet in the parking lot, that's their own problem. <laughs> Believe me, I've had to call security several times. Um, advocate in the community and with politicians to develop laws that protect and promote the health of others. What kind of laws are we talking about here? Hmm? Laws about maybe how many patients are 
Yeah, that would be a very, very good law. You know, California right now is the only state in the United States that regulates patient <coughs> nurse ratios. And it is regulated by their state law. What other types of things? What about health insurance? Lord knows that opens up a whole pot of worms. But one of the, even though I have difficulty with some of the things with uh, the new Obamacare for the lack of better terminology because the other is too long to say, but the ability of children to stay on their parents' health insurance till they're 26 years old was a wonderful benefit. And the coverage for all children was one of the things that you're going to see that was a big benefit. How that's going to change with the new Congress and Senate, who knows? Because it will change in some way. But that's one of the things that we sort of need to be aware of to make sure that you know, nurses advocate for clients that can't say anything. Okay? Voting is one of the ways that we can advocate for our clients. Protect our own pocketbook and values as well. Okay? What other things that we could we do to advocate in the community? Honor Society, what are you doing? Volunteering in clinics. The CDAM project, do you not think that is advocating for the community? I definitely think it is. To make sure that someone has basic needs and a little extra for Christmas. Okay? thing we have to remember is that not only do we want to do that at Christmas, but July it sort of gets a little um, iffy because what you find is that it's just like blood donations. You see a lot of blood donations around Christmas time, but when people are on vacation or out of school or whatever, you see a drastic drop in not only charitable donations, but blood donations and things like that as well. Okay. Some of the unprofessional behaviors that are defined by the Nurse Practice Act, brief of, brief of confidentiality or violation of HIPAA, substance abuse, and discrimination. And that discrimination can be because of race, creed, color, sex, gender, or military service. It can be any type of discrimination. It's not always just black or white. Some other unprofessional behaviors are talking loudly. Okay, One of the things that you have to be very careful about, especially in ICUs or in the nursing units, is a lot of time, you know, when we work nights, nights is our regular shift. Other people are trying to sleep, but we're talking. Work goes on. It also is that lots of times what we don't recognize is that when we sit at that elevator out there and talk, the chemistry lab and the AP lab, it, it gets very loud for them. And they're trying to hear their instructor over what we're talking about. So a lot of times you'll hear the door slam shut as a sort of nonverbal uh, gesture of disapproval. 
And so we just continue to talk and because the door's shut now. Complaining, we talked about. Discussing personal problems or personal phone calls. Okay? One of the reasons why cell phone use is banned at CMC Northeast, you know? What happened? One of the care partners was on her cell phone texting when one of the nurse managers walked up, like the biggie people, like the like Kate Grew, who is the director of nursing, and the person continued to text and never looked up. And so this person is no longer working at the hospital. And there's a new policy that says cell phones cannot be used in the presence uh, at where patients and visitors can view it. Okay? Another situation that I can think of is that a couple of guys were watching one of the basketball games in one of the patient lounges. And they're sitting there just watching the game and Somebody walks up, sits down, walks with, sits with them, watches the game for a little while. Well, it's the administrator of the hospital. And so those guys are no longer employed. So you've got to be careful about what type of personal things or non-work activities that you do. Um... And definitely don't get caught if you're two of them. Gossiping. Lord, did you see what happened at that Christmas parade? <coughs> did you see what she had on? <laughs> not professional. Definitely not professional. Gossiping is, is, does not have a place in the work area. Should not have a place anywhere. But what you're going to see is that we are humans, and it's interesting. And so it's one of those things that even I have to think, I don't really need to hear this, I don't want to know this, and please don't tell me anymore. But let me hear the first of it. (laughs) (laughs) And I'll feel it (laughs) twice. Gossiping is not professional. All right. Abuse of power is also not professional. Sexual harassment, intimidation, or improper use of power. Whether it be for co-work, between co-workers or with patients. Okay? One of the things you do not want to do is to have a patient do something because you've intimidated them. If you don't take your pill, I am not going to let you have breakfast. (laughs) Okay? It's called coercion. Legally, what is that also called? It's assault. Okay? Verbal threats are assault. So take your pill. <laughs> Improper use of power. <coughs> One of the things that you will see is that physicians and nurses are in a position of power in the hospital situation, okay? Typically what you will see is that when that patient comes in by bureaucratic means, they lose some of their power. Well, we as nurse advocates hope to give to allow them to retain some of their power. And remember that autonomy allows them to make their own decisions. And what we should do is promote that. We don't want them to have that 
me being on this pedestal, you're down here in the dumps, power issue, okay? Remember that patient should be an equal partner with making those treatment decisions because they ultimately have the decision to do what they want to do. Sexual har harassment or harassment it can be coworker to coworker, it can be boss to boss, it can be employee to patient. <coughs> One of the things we're starting to see is a lot more sexual assaults reported in healthcare facilities. One of the things that you will find is that when you start a new job, that you will have to go through sexual harassment training. What is it? What do I do about it? Who do I report it to? So those are some of the things that you're going to see with abuse of power, and none of that is professional. I know last night none of you watched Bones, but I did. <laughs> but there was a situation in a, where one of the guys that has been going through chemotherapy, the nurse asked him out. And I'm thinking... No. But they did clarify it. Well, you're no longer my patient because you've, let, you've had your last chemotherapy treatment. Okay? A little bit, but still, that is one of the very, very, very sticky areas. You don't date patients. You don't go out with them. So I consider that abuse of power. But I'm not sure that they will get a ton of letters about that because they did clarify but abuse of power is one of those things that you have to be very careful about alright just sort of a summary professional behaviors attendance and punctuality they come into work on time that's one of the things we've tried to engender into you with clinical specifically because that's one of the things that will get you fired very quickly is if you're late, consistently late, a write-up, a counseling, and if it happens two or three times, then <coughs> it's out the door. Just like no calls, no shows. You get one of those, the second one, you're OTD. With communication, active listening, Referring to your patient by the last name, like Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith. Now, with my patient population, a lot of times with my confused, head-injured clients or my patients with Alzheimer's, a lot of times first names are more appropriate, but I always ask permission first. Do you mind if I call you Betsy? My name is Renee. Okay? And that's one of the things that you will want to make sure that if you require your patient to call you Miss Hyde, then you should call them by their surname as well. Again, it's one of those power things. I know. I hate it that you call me this Hyde. <laughs> Sir or ma'am, Miss Hyde was my mother-in-law. <laughs> Worth ethic. One of the things we'll see when we talk about some of the generational things this afternoon is that it's very different with different generations. Okay. Now, unprofessional behaviors, multiple absence, habitually tardy, decrease, it basically decreases productivity. We have a friend that's always late. Anywhere you go. So, basically, after the first <coughs> ten times, 
we told Bill 30 minutes before everyone else is supposed to be there, and then Bill would be there on time. <laughs> Until he got wise to that, and then we had to tell him an hour. <laughs> Communication, using medical jar- jargon, okay? What are some of the words that you had problems with when you first came into nursing school? Uh, All of them. <laughs> words to do with going to the bathroom. A lot of the void. It's when you say void. Or void. Or the BM, like, void to me means a black hole. <laughs> I'm a Trekkie from way back. Okay, what else? Big old fancy medical words. Big old med, you know, just big old medical words. Just are not understandable. Right. Have you been OOB today? Or OTD? Or STAT? What does STAT mean? No. Yeah, STAT means now, okay? One of the things, I listen to Blue Collar Radio a lot, and this comment came on, and he said, you know, stat, what does that mean? He says, you know, if I'm in trouble, I don't want them yelling stat, which comes from a dead language. You know, I want them to do something quick. (laughs) And I'm thinking, you know, that's sort of strange that whenever you are... Most people know what that means now. And most people know what a lot of these words mean because they watch Marcus Welby and Grey's Anatomy and, Grey's Anatomy and House. Uh, House. ER and all of those things. You know, one of the things you will learn as a medical professional is that watching those shows will grate on your nerves. You have to watch them for the story and Mm -hmm. not what they're actually doing because sometimes they do it right, but the majority of times they do it wrong. Think about medical jargon when you're thinking about a patient that has English as a second language. First of all, they may not understand everything you said in English, but you start throwing in those words like void or ambulate. Did you walk in the hall? Oh yeah, I did that. Okay. How many of you worked at the VA site? That's a whole other language themselves. Okay. I had a patient ask me for a Johnny one time. <laughs> I need to go to the head. Right? The head of what? <laughs> and then I finally figured out it was the bathroom. All right, so what you find is that lots of times you will have all sorts of things. And that jargon will really throw some people off. All right. I had a patient that tell me one time when I was doing a history that their daughter had smiling baby Jesus disease. Spinal meningitis. It took me a long time to figure that one out. And they kept talking to one another lady talking about uh, she had wrestling legs. <laughs> Restless leg syndrome. I had a lady that tell me that she had flea bites real bad. <laughs> and I started looking at her leg to see, oh God, you know, I'm, here I am. <laughs> and she was talking about phlebitis. <laughs> so. You, it's one of the things that you have to sort of figure out. Sometimes people misinterpret what you're saying. 
and you've got to be very, very careful about that. Yeah. Oh, I did. The wrestling legs, I had to leave the room <laughs> because it was with one of my students, and the students stayed in there, and all I could see was, of course, we are in full contact bar, and we had a mask on because we were doing a sterile dressing tank, and I could see the eyes starting to twinkle, and I said, Excuse me a minute, let me go get some. <laughs> I had to leave the room. Had to leave the room with the wrestling legs. Calling people by their pet names, honey, sweetie, dear. I mean, that's a, it's a southern thing. I mean, you know, bless their heart. <laughs> Which can mean a whole lot of different things. This depends on how you say it. Bless their heart. Usually means poor baby. Worth ethic. Remind me to tell you a joke, not in class, but I've got another one. Uh, basically, worth ethic, that will depend on generation. Okay? And I'm going to tell you one of the things that's one of the biggest conflicts is between what the baby boomer generation thinks and what generation X, what generation Y, and generation Z. We got some Zs out there, guys. They're now 19 years old and they're starting to come into the workplace. Basically, internet use. Whereas the internet used to not be a thing. I remember when computers first came out. All right. My first computer was about the size of this podium. Um, now, they're in your phone. Probably there's about as much memory in my phone as the first computer system at Duke Hospital. Team player, again, will depend on what your generation thinks. All right. Whereas what we consider being a team player, baby boomers, a lot of them think you go in, you do your work individually, you get it done, and then you might help somebody out. All right? <clears throat> a lot of our younger folks, let's do it as a team. Let's get it done. All right, and I will see. I see that with a lot of you guys. A lot of you turn individual things in. A lot of you do it as clinical groups, and it may be generational. It may just be that I don't like to work in groups because I don't want to count on anyone else for my grade. I'm I'm there with you too. Okay, so it is now eleven o'clock. And before we start on leadership, let's take a look. We hope that we've got one person that knows what's going on uh, so that they're the person that other people look to for guidance, uh, for uh, answers. And sometimes what happens is that the leader themselves doesn't have all the answers. And that's okay, because you can't have experience in every situation. So what you're going to see is what are the definitions or what are some of the things about leaders. Well, by definition, a leader is a person that has the ability to rule, guide, inspire, and they influence others to act together to accomplish a goal. And that's one of the key points. Act together to accomplish that goal. Okay? So with leaders, we have formal leaders and we have informal leaders. When you're talking about formal leaders, you're talking about someone that is appointed. Someone... <coughs> that as a virtue of their job, they have been selected and given official authority to lead a group of people. Okay? 
that might be the nurse manager, it may be the charge nurse, the nursing supervisor, the nursing educator. Okay? By virtue of this person's title, they've been, been given the authority to lead or manage those people. Okay? Whenever we started doing team leading, we gave you the title of team leader and the authority to lead your group of people. How did that feel? Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Okay. Why? Because you had no more experience than the rest of them. Yeah. Because they, you were the person that they supposedly looked to for answers. Okay? That's what it's going to be like, guys, whenever you start doing charge. By virtue of that title, you are the person, hopefully, that has more experience than someone else on that unit. And they're the person, you're the, going to be the person that says, well, we're getting five admissions. And this is where I want those five admissions to go because I don't want all of my heavy patients on one side of the unit. Okay? Because that's going to be a disaster when you try to do assignments. It's also the person that says that... Oh, I've got a call out. Well, with this group of patients, I can survive with one less nurse. Or I have to call the nursing supervisor or the nurse manager to make sure that I have enough people here to cover these patients that we've got. What other types of things was uncomfortable whenever you did that role of team leader or acting as that charge nurse? Other than you didn't know any more than the rest of them. Patient assignment, okay? Because payback is, you know what? <laughs> Basically, you know, the thing is, is that you want people to have opportunities for learning, but you don't want to overwhelm someone because you've got to remember is they're going to be your team leader next week, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> payback is a bitch. <laughs> So, that's sort of one of the things that you've got to remember whenever you're in that charge nurse role. Because unless you are working on a unit, and some units designate that just this one person, whenever they're there, by virtue of their job title, either PCC or charge nurse, that they're always going to do charge. Some people rotate it. Some institutions pay a premium. It's like a quarter or 50 cents more an hour to do charge. Because it does make sense because you think you are making a little bit more decisions and it's a little bit more responsibility. Okay, that's formal leaders. They're appointed by a title. What about your informal leaders they're not recognized but they're recognized by the group as a leader but they're not officially appointed this may be someone with more seniority someone that's been there for a hundred years someone that may be older or someone that has special abilities When you guys are working, any of you draw blood? Okay. Who do you go to whenever you see someone with a very hard stick and you've tried three times and can't get? The nurse. Who's the nurse go to? Because charge nurse. Okay. Would I go to a charge nurse that I know has no prop, has no ability to get a stick any more than I can? No. For the benefit of that patient, I'm going to go to the person that's most experienced with blood draw. That's the person with that special ability. Or 
someone that has difficult, the difficulty uh, with catheterizations. You know, some of that 89-year-old men with benign prosthetic hypertrophy, you know, it's going to be a very hard catheterization. And you're going to need someone with a lot of experience to be able to do that. Now, what happens whenever you have formal leaders that may not be quite as popular as the informal leaders? Who does the staff typically follow? The informal leader. Okay. And what does that say? Confrontations. Okay. What position does that put that informal leader in? Very awkward position at times. Okay. Now, when you look at characteristics of effective leaders, <clears throat> they use a leadership style that's natural to them. And we'll talk a little bit more about leadership styles in just a few minutes. They use a leadership style that's appropriate to the task. All right? the building's on fire, you don't want to say, okay, we need group consensus about what to do. Right. <laughs> it's like, get your stuff and get out the door. Leave your stuff. Or leave your stuff and get out the door. <laughs> Basically, we want to assess what the effects of their behavior are on other and on the effects of others' behaviors on themselves. If I'm rude to someone, what typically happens back? They're rude to me. And what happens is it continually escalates back and forth. You really want to make someone angry. When they're rude to you, you just be nice as you can be to them. Kill them with kindness. really does. Bless their heart. <laughs> now, what things you will see is that effective leaders also facilitate personal relationships, and they plan and organize activities of the group. Well, sometimes those activities can be work-related, and sometimes they can be social related. They can be the person that plans the parties. They can be the person that always makes sure that they have a birthday card for everyone on staff. They're the person that makes sure that everyone is included. That the new person gets a welcome party. Okay, and a lot of units have gone to that with social uh, with shared governance that there is a social committee. <clears throat> Do you want the person that's Eeyore? I just hate it when it rains. <laughs> to be the head of your social committee? <coughs> no. You want Tigger. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, effective leaders involve all members in decisions whenever possible. And that, whenever possible, may mean that there are some decisions that there is no input. And a lot of those are whenever it comes down from on high. The administration of the hospital says, this is the way that we're going to do this, and this is the policy. And it may be because that that's a law or a change in practice that's occurred, and you have no say in it. But you may have a say in the way that scheduling is done. You may have a say in the way that <coughs> you involve 
your care partners or unlicensed assistive personnel in the care of those clients. Effective leaders value and use group members' contributions. You ask for input, consider it. Because otherwise, if you continually ask for people's input and then ignore it, what are they going to quit doing? Quit telling you because it doesn't do any good. Though I will go to my dying day about getting these stupid wheels taking off these tables. They are doing that. That's what Carl was in here counting the tables for. He's got the orc. He um, had to, he's going to have to order more wheels, but we're getting some of these gone. Was he the entire table? Just the wheels. Well, no, they're going to be elevated, <coughs> but they're just not going to be rolling. So, it's only taken almost three years, but... Uh, assess for and promote use of current technology okay use of computers, use of iPads, use of whatever uh, to make sure that the work and productivity are done okay some of your leadership theories fall into these three categories and so let's talk about the trait theories okay when you talk about trait theories you're talking about leaders that uh, possess specific traits and ability that are inherent. Some of these can be taught, but some of them cannot be. Um, good judgment, decisiveness, and by decisiveness I'm talking about not like Charlie Graham with being wishy-washy. Okay. They make a decision and they stick to it until evidence comes along that perhaps that, that was not the right decision. Knowledge, adaptability, integrity, tact. And what do I mean by tact? Thinking before you open your mouth. Okay. There's a way to give feedback without putting someone down. And that is something that can be learned and should be learned. Self-confidence and cooperativeness are other traits that you might see in leaders. Um, with your behavioral theories of leadership, these are more learned. Or these may be based on their life experiences or training or education. And when you look at behavioral those uh, theories, you're talking about autocratic, democratic, laissez-faire, bureaucratic, or situational leaderships. Okay? Think of autocratic leaders as it's my way or the highway. Think of this more like the military. Your officers control what happens. The person that's at the top passes that information down about what we will do, how we will do it, and how high we will jump whenever I say jump. My way or the highway. Autocratic leaders make decisions for the group. Do it my way. They typically believe that individuals are externally motivated. If I give you an award, if I give you money, if I give you praise, or recognition, or good grades, that that's what motivates you. <laughs> they don't typically believe that people can be self-motivated. That they do it for the love of learning. 
With autocratic leaders, typically what you see is that the group may feel very secure because they know what they're supposed to do because somebody's telling them, this is exactly what you're going to do when you're going to do it. Think of this sort of as mama. You will clean your room. And you will do it now. And you will not give me any back <laughs> Activities are very predictable with autocratic leaders. But why is a, working with an autocratic leader not comfortable all the time? You can't talk to them about anything or let them know what your feelings are. What else does it do? Yeah. <laughs> right. Typically, if you have an idea, which may be creativity, a creative way to do something, it stifles that creativity. <clears throat> Self-motivation needs are not met with your autocratic leaders. So people that are creative or innovative or self-motivated often will feel very much like they're pushed down or held to this particular way of doing things. There's very much decreased openness and decreased trust with an autocratic leader. Now, autocratic leaders are very good if they're emergency situations. For example, a cardiac arrest. There's one person that should be leading that code. And that person should be the one that's giving the orders and giving the directions. Bomb threats, nursing unit fires, emergency situations like disasters. What you will see is a very autocratic setup with a command center. Okay? Anyone ever had an autocratic boss? Share. Our feelings. Oh, feelings. I don't see them either. Now, Democrats, we're not talking about Democrats and Republicans here. We're talking Democratic meaning someone that encompasses the entire group. Okay? We're talking about someone that encourages group discussion and decision making. Typically with your Democratic leaders, they, they sort of sit back. And they facilitate the discussion. It's sort of like, okay, well, I mean, what do you feel about that? Well, Ashlyn, do you agree? So it, it's more of a facilitator where you will see that there's more group interaction and <clears throat> that there is group cohesion. Meaning that this this group acts more as a team approach. <coughs> Basically, your democratic leaders believe individuals are internally motivated and they des desire that self satisfaction. Okay. Typically, what you're going to see is that. If you're someone that likes very quick decisions, this leadership style is going to drive you crazy because it's a lot of group consensus and a lot of input. Just make a decision. Typically, it does take a little bit more time to come to consensus. This leader is more guidance than they are control. Now, looking at the pros and cons, 
Your Democratic leaders provide constructive feedback. They offer information and make suggestions. of leader allows for more creativity in the group. And it may be that, well, we can try that for a few weeks and see how that does, and if that doesn't work, we'll try something else. Democratic leaders basically are good if you have a very mature Is it fair, leaders? <coughs> this one is more of a hands off approach. Well, you can do whatever you want. Tell me what we need to do. Whatever. They believe that the group is, again, internally motivated and self satisfied. What happens is that. Your laissez-faire leader sometimes can lead to very poor outcomes or no outcome. Because unless you have a very, very mature group that gets along, there can be a lot of conflict. Typically what you will see with your laissez-faire leaders is that lots of times they want to be liked. And they don't want to come down hard on anyone for anything. But often what happens is that the group itself lacks direction. And again, that poor outcome can happen. Now, your bureaucratic type leader typically does not trust themselves or others to make decisions. This is the person that is married to that procedure manual. Well, let me see what the policy says. Okay, it says in this situation that we do this. Okay, so that's what we'll do. Bureaucratic leaders follow... Policies, procedures to direct their work. Basically what you see is that group members are usually very dissatisfied because they're very inflexible and they're typically very impersonal. These are the people with bureaucratic leaders my grandmother died. Well, I'm sorry, you get a half a day for um, the visitation, and you uh, have a half a day for this, and I need to have a note from the funeral director. And there's no, I'm sorry for your loss, what happened type thing. Okay? They follow the rules to the letter. Situational leaders are flexible in their tasks and in their relationships. They consider their staff members' abilities. They may be the people that say, you get a special project because I know that you like doing bulletin boards. Since I can't draw this straight line, I'm going to write down it. But... What you will see is that they do allow people to do what they do best. They are allow of the context or the environment for the task to take place. Situational leaders are flexible. Thinking of this lady in this yoga pose. Situational leaders are flexible. Of course, I would be pretzel. <laughs> and the traits that what you will see with situational leaders will change based on what the situation will be. 
whereas sometimes they may be more of the autocratic style, sometimes they will be more the democratic style. It depends on the situation. Now when you compare the different styles, this is just what it looks like up against. Now, those were your behavioral leadership styles. These are what we've sort of progressed to. Contemporary leadership theories is charismatic. Charismatic leaders, okay, are characterized by emotional relationship between the leader and the group members. They are charming personalities that evoke strong feelings of commitment to the leader and to the leader's beliefs. Who is an example of a charismatic leader? David Koresh. David Koresh. Okay, the cult, the Kool-Aid people. Mm-hmm. Of the, the Branch Wagon. Davidians. Yeah. David Jones and the, was the Kool-Aid people. Jim Jones. Jim Jones, yeah. David was one of the monkeys. <laughs> what about Oprah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she always gets a Oh, if you think she's not a leader, I'm sorry. She's got one of the biggest economic impacts on the United States economy that there's ever been. Whenever she first came out with her book of the month, Book sales increased by almost five million dollars. Oh. Hitler is also a very charismatic leader. Unfortunately for the world, he uh, was able to convince people that his beliefs were correct. But if you look at the history, very, very charismatic. Did you know Hitler was also an artist? His paintings are actually quite good. All right, charismatic leaders. Typically what you will see is that with this type of leader, people follow you no matter what. Think of uh, PTL. Remember here in Charlotte with the Tammy Faye Baker and the Jim Bakers. Those folks were very charismatic leaders. Transactional leaders are another form. And think of that as money. Okay? Basically, the relationship with the transactional leader is... I'll give you something if you do something for me. Um, Basically, what's valued by the follower. They use incentives to promote loyalty and performance. That premium pay that you see whenever shifts can't be covered. You sign up for another shift on someone else's unit. Because you're getting, what is, it, what is it they call it? Incentive pay. Incentive pay, and then there's critical critical need pay or something like that. Shift this to work the off shifts. Shift this to work off shifts. Basically, nights on weekends can get you almost... Eight to ten dollars extra per hour. And in fact, I will tell you that I have had some new grads that make almost as much as I do with their shift dip. Yep. Yeah. So transactional leaders, I give you something, you give me something back. Okay, it's like going to a store and buying something. <clears throat> Basically, that give and take works. 
until someone doesn't have any more to give or someone doesn't need anything. All right? When those critical needs shifts are no longer there, that transaction ends. Transactional leaders typically are main, used to maintain the status quo. Make sure the shifts are covered. Now, transformational leadership is one of the things that you'll see in a lot of the literature now. With transformational leadership <clears throat> is a leader who motivates followers to perform to their full potential. <coughs> Think of this as a coach. This is the Vince Lombardi of the work world. Of course, a lot of you don't know who Vince is. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Very famous. Also, great Um, Transformational leaders foster creativity. They foster risk taking and commitment and collaboration. They inspire others. Um, it basically is a leadership style that they come out with, this is our goal. And what do you need me to help you do so that we can reach our goal? And it may mean that different team members are doing different things, but as long as that goal is accomplished, then that leadership style works. One of the things that we are going to in a lot in nursing, and part of that is due to the magnet status that Joint Commission has come up with, um, or the ANA, or NLN, or whomever else is into tuned into magnet. Um, a lot of that is shared leadership. And if you look at that, it's that no one person is considered more valuable than the group of people. By <clears throat> legal definition, whenever you do shared governance, there still has to be a head nurse because that's what the law says. There is a head nurse or nurse manager that has ultimate responsibility. But... In a true, true shared governance philosophy or model, that nurse manager's vote is just as important as that staff nurse's vote. Okay. What you will find is that with shared governance, you will have decision making that's distributed among a group of of uh, members. Any of you work on a unit that uses self-governance? Practice council? What is that like? What do you do? Like if you have a concern or you want to change something on the unit, you bring it to the practice council and we vote yes or no, and then they have to say but her vote the same as everybody yeah. else. A lot of times what you will see is that shared governance, a lot of units have committees where they will do scheduling. And the scheduling is done by the, uh, the scheduling committee. There is a practice committee. There is a um, QI committee. So it's like uh, governing by committee. And hopefully nursing shared governance is a whole lot more effective than Congress because what Congress should be is an effective shared governance. But that isn't always the case. But with shared government that one leader their vote is similar to what you see with the rest of the staff. Unless it is a decision that has been handed down. Okay? And then the role of that nurse manager is to follow what that procedure or protocol could be. Now, it might be that in practice what may happen is that suggestions may filter back up through that nurse manager. 
but <clears throat> typically what you'll see is that nurse manager will have the same vote as that staff person in true shared government. All right. When you talk about effective leadership, I think probably Stephen Covey uh, wrote this book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, and he developed this philosophy that emphasizes effectiveness on principle and character. And whenever he looked at some of those principles, fairness, honesty, integrity, human dignity, quality, and potential growth. And we've talked about pretty much all of those as we've gone through. These are Covey's habits. Be proactive. What do I mean by proactive? What's proactive versus reactive? You plan ahead. Okay? Well, if this happens, this is what I would do. Or one of the best signs that I've ever seen is remember if plan A doesn't work, there are 25 other letters in the alphabet. Okay? Be proactive. <laughs> Begin with the end in mind. What do you want to have accomplished? And the way that I get there will depend on what I'm most comfortable with. Put first things first. Set your priorities. Determine what those priorities are and get those done first. Don't clean the house. Don't go to the grocery shopping and then come back and try to study. Think win-win. Okay? Whenever you're talking about conflict, what is a win-win situation? It, it's mostly a compromise because what happens? Both parties get something that they want, right? Okay? What is a win-lose situation? Somebody loses. That's a basketball game. Someone comes out on top. Someone wins that game. And there's a loser. What is lose-lose? Nobody gets anything they want. And they're both unhappy. That's the situation you definitely need to avoid. At work, at home, at school, wherever. Seek first to understand, then be understood. What does that mean? Seek first to understand. See where that other person's coming from, and the best way to do that is listen. You need to listen to other what other people are trying to tell you, and then you state your stance. Synergize, and that's not like that little pony lady that does that exercise, the jazzercise. Synergy is like bringing people together in a synergistic relationship so that the power increases with the two of those people or three of people coming together. What do they mean by sharpening the saw? And it's not literal. Getting rid, of Getting rid of unneeded things or learn new things. Okay? Because one of the things that you will learn is that the best way to deal with situations sometimes is to go to a workshop. Find out what they're doing all over the United States in this situation. With this Ebola thing that's come out, the Lord only knows I don't, how many emails I get from the CDC and the ANA and the NLN every day about changes in practice because of infection control 
things that are coming out. Do I read them all? No. But if I were to go into a situation, don't stop that. Uh, if you will go into a situation where I know that I was caring for one of that patients, I would know where I need to go to get that stuff, right? So part of that is knowing what your resources are. Now, not only do we worry about that with nursing, but we worry about that with our patients and families. Okay? We want to make sure that we understand what that client is saying. Making sure that we know what physical therapy is saying for that outcome for that patient. And then we can state our point. and I'm not talking about out of your eyeballs. <coughs> what do I mean? Seeing the, See the whole picture, looking at a mental image of possible and desirable results. What we hope is that it's a positive result. The other thing, of course, is influence. Informal strategy used to gain the cooperation of others without exercising formal authority. Influence is what you see with a lot of your informal leaders. Okay? And being a very positive role model. One of the ways that you hope that you're treated should be the way that you treat others. Okay? So we want to be caring with our attitude, not only with our clients, but why should I treat my co-workers, who are supposedly my friends, any much less like a human being than I would treat one of my patients? So you learn that you need to care about your co-workers as well as your clients. Alright, so... responsibility that you've given them but they don't think for themselves think of them as a herd of sheep usually there's a lead sheep and that lead sheep goes one way and this goes what it's like a school of fish okay 
The other type of followers like yes people, they lack enterprise. They yield to the opinions of others or the decisions of others. A lot of people that work with politicians are yes people. They don't often get told no. Alienated followers... They're capable of independence and critical thinking but because they resist opposition, they're sort of passive. But whatever. Survivors. Survivors often are the people that don't make waves. They don't take risks. And they check to see which way the wind's blowing before they decide what they want to do. These are your people that sort of hang back and see which way. They're the people that when they go to a party, they have three outfits in their car. And they watch and see what people are wearing in, and then they go to the gas station and change. <laughs> <laughs> or if they go overdressed, they, oh, I've got another party to go to. Effective followers. These are the people that take initiative. These are the people that think for themselves. They're confident. They're committed. They're supportive. And they contribute to the success of that organization. Being an effective follower is what you want to be. Effective followers are very self-directed. And what do I mean by that? You don't have to tell them to do every little thing. This is what you want your kids to be. All right? Go clean your room. And you look, and there's still socks on the floor. Pick up the socks. <coughs> well, now what do I do with them? <laughs> Put them in the laundry basket. <laughs> well, it depends on what. I only had one, so I didn't have to worry about that. But you want people that are self-directed. They think for themselves, and they can figure out solutions to problems. <coughs> They actively participate in setting group direction. These are the people that contribute to discussions. When there is a group problem, well, I think we should look at this option. Or I think that's a good suggestion. Why don't we try that for a while? Effective followers invest time and energy in the work of groups. All right. Think about this. How many group projects have you had in this program? Too many. Too many? What was the most frustrating part? about that group projects. Getting people together. Getting people together to invest time and energy in the work of the group. What usually ends up happening? One person does the, the stuff, right? Okay. Is that fair? No. It's not. But, sort of like little red hen syndrome, all right, you're not going to affect my grade just because you're slack. I'm going to get it done so that we can make sure that our stuff is together. Effective followers or effective group members do invest that time and energy. And what happens is if they don't, the rest of the group calls them on it. Or they should. Let's just put it that way. Effective followers think critically and advocate for new ideas. If this way didn't work, let's try something else. What else can we try 
that would be more effective. The best followers discover problems, they inform their leaders, but they always offer a solution. <coughs> this is why people that see there is a problem Just wanted to let you know that the door in room so and so is broken, but I've called maintenance to get it fixed. Okay, not here's my problem, you fix it. Okay, what you want to do is that, say, for example, there is a call out and you don't have a care partner or a unlicensed assisted personnel, a UAP, for the next shift. You're the person that took the call. So and so is going to be out. Because her 12th grandmother died. <laughs> <laughs> So, what do you do? What would be the, how would you let the leader know that there's a possibility of solving that problem? What would you, could you do? Look, get the list of people who wrote on the schedule that they'd like to work extra. This time of year, it's usually very long because everyone's trying to come up with Christmas money, okay? Uh, we used to call them refrigerator nurses. <laughs> they would work until they got their refrigerator paid for. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, it's a little bit more than it used to be, okay? Now you could buy a $300 refrigerator and it'd be great. Now it's like $3,000. Mm -hmm. Huh? The pay is still the same. Pay is still the same. Taxes are more, though. Okay? But, basically, you want to, to come up with some kind of solution. You might want to see if anyone else wants to stay, someone else wants to come in, or look at your patient load. You may not need that UAP. Okay? So... When you give a problem, an effective follower gives a solution. They're supportive of new ideas suggested by others. <coughs> well, that's not the way we've always done it, and I don't think it's going to work because we've never tried that before, and, you know, I don't see what's wrong with what we've been doing. How many times have you heard that? Well, sometimes something about change is good because, yeah, it may have worked in the past, but it may not work with this new, the way we're doing health care. <coughs> if you disagree, explain why. Well, I'm not sure that'll work because of so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. Instead of, that'll never work. Listen carefully and share that knowledge with others. Listening is one of the best skills that you can have either as a leader or as a follower. Okay? Now, we talked a little bit about work ethic when we talked about professional behaviors, attendance and punctuality. I'm going to tell you guys, it's one of the evaluation things that I have to fill out on your clinical reference forms. They will ask about attendance and punctuality. They will ask about reliability and accountability because those are important key things about your worth ethic. Okay? All right. Questions about leadership and followership? All right, let's talk about some of the fun things. <coughs> Generational differences. Uh, generation is defined as having similar life experiences, 
uh, generation fairly spans about 20 years. Though I'm going to tell you uh, the last couple of generations that they've identified, there is a Generation Z out there now. Um, it's not 20 years. It's much less than that. Um, right now, what we're seeing is generations from the workforce looked at this information last year. This is sort of what we're seeing. Veterans, about 5%. Baby boomers, 40%. Gen Xers, about 40%. Millennials or Gen Ys, about 15%. And I would say in the next year or so, we'll have to add Gen Z to this because those Gen Z people are now 19. The, the oldest people in that uh, generation are 19. And we will probably start seeing some of those not only in school, but as nursing assistants, et cetera, et cetera. And it makes a difference with management styles. Now, veterans, these are people that were termed the silent generation. They were born from 1925 to 1945. And if you do the math, People that were born in 1945 are now 69 years old. And a lot of those people are still in the workforce because they have no money to retire. Before I left Duke, I was orienting an 80-year-old LPN back into the workforce. She had retired for several years to care for her husband that had cancer <coughs> and decided that after he died, she didn't want to stay alone at nights. Well, get a dog. <laughs> Instead of coming back to work. But at 80 year old, she was coming back to work nights on Euro because she was afraid to stay by herself. Play a rock wall or a uh, uh, yeah. Magnum, we'll take care of it. Or Beretta one. We have a uh, we have a guy where I work. He was born in 1911. I don't know if any of you are familiar with High Point Hospital, <coughs> uh, but if you go into the cafeteria, there is a picture of this gentleman. His name is Andrew. And Andrew worked at High Point Hospital for a hundred years. A hundred years. He started in the garden at eight, age eight. And uh, whenever the hospital no longer had to grow their food, they brought him in as a transporter to the OR. And he worked there at the hospital for a hundred years. So there is this humongous portrait of Andrew in the cafeteria. So if you go there, don't eat the food, but look at the picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Now, with your baby boomers, typically what you see with characteristics of this generation, they're highly respectful of authority and hierarchy. They're used to very clear divisions of labor. You do this, I do this. Okay? Because a lot of these people that were born in this generation did factory work or piecemeal. Okay? So very clear divisions of labor. They value hard work and discipline. They want that order. They're very conservative in their thoughts in their work and what you find is that they're very slow to adapt to new methods of work and technologies. When CMC Northeast converted to computerized charting, there were several of the older nursing assistants that retired instead of learning that new technology. They decided that it wasn't worth a hassle. They understand rules. They dislike waste. 
they're very patriotic and loyal. Baby boomers are your next generation. Baby boomers are those people born between 1946 and 1964. They were raised in traditional nuclear families. And by that I mean a mom, a dad, and 2.3 children. Which used to be the average children. I don't want to know what the point three looks like, though. <laughs> Basically, what you're going to see is that baby boomers witnessed great technological changes. They saw the advent of computers. They saw the advent of the space race. They saw the advent of all sorts of things. Remember, this generation... It's when we first started seeing the use of antibiotics. Penicillin did not come into play until after World War II. It was developed after World War I, but no one saw the use for it until after World War II. Basically, your baby boomers, a lot of the change the world philosophy the Woodstock generation. The we are the world, we are the people, okay? <laughs> Those types of things. A lot of altruism, a lot of support, the farm aid, the band aid, and all sorts of things that came out. With your baby boomers and those Woodstock generation, question authority. Why? They're like toddlers. Why? Because I said so. Which is what your veterans are telling the baby boomers. Well, why? Independent critical thinkers. Now, a lot of your baby boomers get their self-worth from their contributions to their professions. These are people that went into nursing and went into teaching because they thought it was an honorable profession. Still is, both of them, but it's a little bit more difficult to deal with. Your baby boomers seek financial security promotions and personal fulfillment from work, from work. <laughs> they adapted slowly to changing technology but they've adapted because it related to work. And typically what you will see is that workaholics and overachievers are what you see associated with this generation. Now, the baby boomers had kids, and they were Gen X. Born 1965 to 1980. This is the generation of what we call latchkey kids. Basically because they were raised in single-parent <coughs> homes, and they came home after school, and there was no one home. Mom and Dad, if they were present, were both at work. Or if Dad had already moved out and moved on, Mom was at work. 40% of your Gen Xers were raised in single-parent homes. Characteristics. Well, because they had to do for themselves, what you see is they're independent, they're assertive, and they're innovative. They're well-traveled. <laughs> These are not people that have never been out of North Carolina. I have some people that have never been out of Salisbury. <laughs> they value individualism. They work to live rather than live to work. Live to work is going to be who? Baby boomers. Your Gen Xers, 
or I'll do as much work as it needs so that I can go somewhere. Okay? They value their individualism. They're less loyal to your organizations and less tolerant of authority. Tell me to do something, but tell me why. They're very adaptable to change. These are your P first generation that probably grew up with that Nintendo or Xbox in their hands. And they expect instant gratification. It is killing some of you in here because the grades have not been released yet. <laughs> and I know that. Now, this is what you see. Instant gratification, instant answers with this generation. Okay? Well, why can't I have it? Right now. Just now. <laughs> Think about that whenever you're dealing. Okay, millennials. <laughs> Born in 1980 and later. Okay, really until about uh, 1995. Millennials are Generation Y. These people grew up in the age of terrorism. Okay? They lived through the Olympic uh, terrorist incident, they lived through 9 11 and some of the other terrorist plots that have happened. You will see an explosion in social networking. This is when Facebook came out. And information technology became commonplace. Okay, it used to be if you had a computer, it was like, oh, a computer. Do you work at home? <laughs> Uh, no. I play games on it mostly. <laughs> Typically what you will see with your Gen Ys is they're very protective and careful about themselves. They're confident, expressive, optimistic, and very self-indulgent. This is the me generation. What's in it for me? What can you do for me? They're the least religious, best educated, and most racially diverse generation of recent generations. Now, that is changing. And you'll see that in just a minute in Gen Z. Basically, the religion is about the same. But your Gen Zs are going to be much better educated and much more racially diverse. Typically with your Gen Ys, they're very strong networkers, sophisticated, street smart. They work in teams. All right, think about, well, for me, you played with the kids in the neighborhood. And that's who you played with unless it was at school. What do you see with Gen Ys? They had play dates. <laughs> they had social calendars at the age of two. <laughs> Mom said, oh, let's have a play date. And you arranged to bring your child to play with someone. <laughs> they work in teams. <coughs> they work in teams. All right? Basically, these folks do much better with gin... Why, people, you have to say individual work. Individual work. You may not collaborate. <laughs> because you're so used to doing it in teams. I mean, you look it up on the Internet and you do it. Okay? Again, they seek gratification, feedback, and recognition. If they're unhappy, they give up and move on. There's, the grass is always greener. 
okay? Whereas, remember, your veterans were very loyal. Those are the people that worked for Pilatex for 30 years, and then they retired. Your baby boomers may work 15 to 20 years at some place, and then they move to another place because their husband probably moved them. Okay? Your Gen X may have five or six jobs in a lifetime, or they may have more than that. Your Gen Ys, I'm sorry. <laughs> they lucky if they have a job. They lucky if they got a job, you're right. But if they're unhappy, so I see ya. I can move somewhere else. And this is what you see. Okay. Now, when you talk about this next generation, remember, you're born in 95, 19-year-olds, we're going to start seeing these folks in the workplace. Look at this, guys. They are projected to have 17 jobs and move 15 <laughs> times in a lifetime. These are your global citizens. These are your very mobile people. Even if they live in Rowan County. <laughs> Travel nurses, maybe. Gen Z people are realistic, cautious, and very security minded. In some areas. Okay, remember terrorism <laughs> and stranger danger is what they've been taught. <laughs> Okay, and what we learned in the abuse class is stranger danger is not what you worry about, it's uncle danger. Okay. Okay. Basically, what you will see is that they are inspired to improve the world that they are in. They are very inquisitive and very globally aware. They already offer suggestions about solving problems. There, there is a 14-year-old out there with 16 patents already. And one of his patents is about curing cancer. And it probably is going to be one of the biggest breakthroughs in cancer care out there. 14 or 15 years old. Now, this should be ours. Look at this. They're very tech savvy and visually literate. Tech use a day. 10 hours, 19 minutes. And we're not talking just TV. We're talking TV, cell phone, computer, Whatever. You know they don't even have textbooks in school anymore. No, they don't have textbooks in school. They're online. They bring them home. Look at this. With Gen Z, they do over 15 million Google searches a day. Over 4 billion YouTube videos a day. Probably 2 million of those are cat videos. <laughs> This is the generation that if you need something done computer-wise, you call your kid. Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't call someone in your generation, or at least not in my generation. Look at this, guys. One in two out of this generation will be university educated. That's good. That's great. However, that means that they will be paying their student loans until they're 75. Yeah, and less job. But they embrace diversity, meaning that they're more accepting of their peers, whether it be racially, gender, sexual orientation. Okay? This is one of the things that is very concerning. Mm -hmm. It's projected that over 60% of these people will be obese by the time they reach age 21. So as nurses, this is going to be one of the things that we're going to have to face with this generation. 
Okay? Alright. So, let's talk about conflict. Consequences of real and perceived differences in mutual goals, values, ideas, beliefs, feelings, or actions. So, Based on those generational differences that I've told you about, what do you think one of the biggest conflict might be in the workplace? Between, say, someone that's either a veteran and a baby boomer versus someone that's Gen Y or Gen Z? Yeah. Question. Questioning authority. You know, that little teenager was rude. <laughs> respect me. Because no respect for my authority. Well, no. That's the generation that you see that there is, well, why do I need to do that? Why does it have to be done that way? Jennifer, what was your comment? Um, just like other people they Right. Team versus individual approach. I'd much rather work with a team of people than somebody that lets me slog along and try to get all my stuff done and they're sitting over here. Look, look how hard she's working. Okay. About their ethics. I think the older generations are more likely to come to work and be dedicated to the younger people than when they're calling out with 12 grandma on death and all that. Right. And I think that that's what you're going to see people with 12 grandmas that die in both <laughs> all <laughs> generations. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, it's, it's what you see with the older generations is there's more loyalty. And what you often see is they come to see work sick, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. What would you, you know, with those Gen Zs that have fit 17 jobs in their lifetime? If I've worked at one place for the past 30 years, how am I going to view that? No accountability, they job hop. It used to be one of the things as, as a manager that you look at is see how many jobs they've had in the past 10 years. And if they'd had more than three, that resume went through because you didn't want them. But what we're going to have to see is that that really has changed with the way that, that our world is going to now. And that generational difference will make a tremendous amount of difference. Hopefully, most of the managers that you're going to see are going to be those baby boomers. But remember, the first group of baby boomers retired two years ago. <coughs> So a lot fewer of those veterans are out there. And hopefully you will find that that you're going to see a whole lot less conflict because hopefully people understand the difference. Now with conflict behaviors, one of the things that you will see um, with co uh, conflict is that people feel either perceived or felt. All right, perceived conflict is that you think someone slighted you, whether they really did or not. Uh, felt conflict usually is there is a conflict that did occur in some way, and it usually is an outward uh, form of conflict, whether it may be arguing or disrespect or whatever. Uh, covert behaviors may be things like scapegoating, avoidance, or apathy. I don't care what you do. Do what you want to. Makes no difference to me. One of the things that you're going to see that is going to be different is that when you're talking about conflict, there is a gender issue that comes into play. Basically what you're going to see that men have been historically socialized to respond either directly 
or aggressively to conflict. Get it over, get it out of the way. And then they go on. Women, what do we do? We think about it. And we think about it. And we get madder and madder and madder. And you remember whenever you left your socks on the side of the bed the night of our party three months before we got married 25 years ago? We remember everything. But that's not a therapeutic way to deal with conflict. Typically, women are more socialized to build relationships. We're soothers. It'll be all right. Or bless <laughs> And they try to bring people together and not drive them apart. One of the things you need to think about is how. what does your employer manual say about how you deal with conflict? And this says, are you sure that this is what the employee manual meant when it said to work out any conflicts ourselves? Okay. One of the things that as new nurses, I'm unfortunate to say that you're going to face um, is workplace bullying or lateral violence. I've included an article on incivility in nursing, uh, which is basically what they term it in the literature. Incivility sounds nicer than bullying, but that's exactly what it is. Um, it's either malicious, repeated, harmful mistreatment. It may be verbal abuse. Um, it can be at times physical abuse. But typically what you will see is more verbal abuse. The article talks a little bit about how you manage conflict and how you deal with it. And I like this shirt. If I've had two, my mother needed it from my brother and I. You can see it says our get along shirt. Okay. And what my mother did is she had this little 18 inch rope and we had to hold the rope and walk around and do whatever with the rope. But I like the get along shirt. Okay, so it forces you to to face that conflict. Um, basically as a manager, one of the things that you have to think about is do you make a decision to intervene or do you let it work it out? Often what you will find is that letting people work out their conflict is a better option than you stepping in. Now, however, if it is a situation where people will do actual physical harm to each other or uh, damage the morale of the unit, then it is the responsibility of that nurse manager to step in and do something. And I've included a few rules for mediating conflict there. It doesn't matter what the conflict is. People need to respect the opinions of others and not blame. Uh, open discussion and full expression of both positive and negative feelings in that accepting atmosphere. Um, one of the things that you can do, you know, Ms. Rumble is all about the data. If you've got data evidence to strengthen your position, it makes it a whole lot easier to defend. We want to encourage the parties to provide fee frequent feedback, not only in that mediation situation, but say in a week, you go to them and say, how's it going? What's happening? How are you feeling about what happened? Be knowledgeable about the organizational policies, procedures, standards, and the law. Well, you have to do that. Because there's a little thing called hostile work environment. And you have to be very careful about making sure that no one is treated unreasonably and unfairly. Okay? And then lastly, when you're talking about conflict, 
An eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. So even though the Bible says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, 